Hi and welcome to the final theory video in this series. If you've made it this far, you'll be on board with the questioning drills and the repeated themes. There's just one more theory video to go before the uh, example hands. And by the end of this video, you'll be fully equipped with both tops app god h and to spar bap god h and you'll be in a position to go away and put this into practice by now this will be a familiar slide our focus now shifts to the right hand side elements of bap god h as we look to form smart and effective thought processes after the cards are dealt board texture is the only completely new element so we need to spend some time on this the first key question to ask is, what's the board texture? You ought to be able to define the flop as wet, average or dry. Broadly speaking, wet flops have suited or connected cards on them, whereas dry flops are rainbow and unconnected. Board texture is important for lots of reasons, and one of them is for bet sizing. We already talked about how SPR can influence bet sizing, and we We'll also discuss how bluff heavy or value heavy ranges can influence it. But for now, just consider the wetness of the board and see the impact it should have on your bet sizing. This is a very simplified but useful table of guidelines. They're not rules, they're guidelines. You can see that the wetter and more dynamic the board is, the larger the recommended bet sizes are. When the board is dry and static, smaller bet sizes are appropriate. By following these guidelines, you will often present a larger problem to your opponent with the majority of his hand range. The next question to ask about board texture is how well does the board hit each player's range? To answer this, you'll want to think about what each player's range consists of. Often, high cards will suit the aggressor, whereas low cards will suit the defender. When there's a big difference between the ranges, this matters a lot, whereas when both players have similar ranges, it matters less. There are two concepts on the right that are important. One is range advantage. The player with range advantage should be more inclined to throw chips in. This can change when the turn or river is dealt if a particular card helps one range and not the other. That's why it's important to reconsider range advantage on the turn and the river, not just at the flop stage. The other concept is nut advantage. This is particularly important when pots get large or when planning for large pots. Which player is more likely to be holding the strongest possible hand? It's not always the player with the range advantage. If your opponent holds the nut advantage, you might sometimes prefer to keep a pot smaller. When you are studying board texture, use Flopzilla or for Apple users, Poker Cruncher. These are incredibly powerful tools and allow you to visualize how different ranges hit different types of boards. You can study the equity of one range against another across the post-flop streets and you can spot opportunities to exploit situations where you have a nut advantage. You need to pay attention to any action that takes place post-flop before it's your turn to act. Once you have this information, you'll know which of the six post-flop scenarios you are in. For those of you unfamiliar with the six post-flop scenarios, they were a big feature of my book, Post-Flop Volumes 1 and 2, and they help to compartmentalize some of this information we're trying to process. Specifically, they bracket together who the aggressor is, who has position, and what the action facing us is. So for example, Post-flop scenario one or PS1 has you as the pre-flop aggressor in position and facing a check. Your decision would therefore be whether to see bet or to check behind. If you want to find out more, there are YouTube videos on this, or you can grab a copy of post-flop, which is an extensive study of betting lines within each of these six scenarios. The information you need, whether you choose to use PS1 to 6 or not, comes from these three factors. Relative position, pre-flop action, and post-flop action. 
For calculating pot odds, there's no difference between the pre-flop and the post-flop. Rather than going over the same information, I thought I'd show you a table that can help you to memorize the most important bit of mathematics in the game of poker. Now I've written this from the perspective of us laying the bet, but it works just as well for facing a bet. On the left hand side, you have the bet size that is chosen. In the middle, the minimum fold equity required by the better for that bet to break even, that's not taking into account showdown equity. Finally, on the right hand side, you have the pot odds being presented to the opponent. So, if someone makes a pot size bet, your odds for calling are always 33%. If someone makes a half pot size bet, your odds for calling are always 25%. These numbers are always true, and that's why it's worth learning them. Professional poker players don't sit there and work out their precise odds. They have tables like this memorized. If someone annoyingly bets 83% of the pot, they don't spend ages working out the precise odds. They simply refer to the nearest number, in this case, 75%. So they know their pot odds will be slightly more than the 43% they've got memorized, say 45%. Approximations are normal. Don't try and be too precise. And we arrive at the most challenging part of the whole process, working out post-flop GTO ranges. You'll need to split this into two. There's your own ranges and then there's the villain's ranges. Which one you start with will depend on who acts first. Normally it will be an opponent, even if they check to you. The first post-flop range you build will start to become more and more familiar over time, especially common situations such as pre-flop mid-position raise, big blind call, and just two players seeing a flop. So the first time you try and do this, it's very complicated and hard to make any sense of, but over time and practice, you'll start to spot patterns and recognize trends. Whenever you are analyzing a player's range, start by breaking it up into the different options. If he can only check or bet, then those are your two categories. You need to choose a bet size that makes sense, for example, half the pot, and then start breaking up his different types of hands into those two categories. Often with GTO ranges, you will find that for any given hand, the correct solution is to sometimes bet and sometimes check. This is extremely confusing to start with, but over time, with an understanding of frequencies, you can start to predict how the GTO solution is built. So when we're trying to do this process in real time, we're quickly forming categories, which we've done many times before in practice. We're recalling similar situations we've solved in the past, and then we're boxing up the various hand types into the available categories. If possible, you want to try and repeat this for as many of the active opponents as you can though it does get really hard in multi-way pots. Whenever you struggle, which will be often, you make the best possible assumptions for each range and then just move on. Here's yet another reminder that building GTO ranges is insanely difficult. If you're a perfectionist, you need to set some realistic goals as to how accurate you can hope to be. Even Rain Man would struggle with this. So we're not aiming to be perfect. We're trying to calculate the frequency with which a player should take certain actions and then fitting his various hands into the available categories of actions in a way that matches those frequencies. When you're practicing, you can use a piece of GTO software to show you what solutions look like. The more you practice, the smarter you will become. I've listed a few useful programs here. Personally, I use PO Solver. This is what PO Solver looks like. It's a wonderful tool, which is becoming more and more powerful. 
The decision displayed in this particular hand is a point on the turn card, where a player faces a bet and has to break up his range into three categories. Fold is displayed in blue, call in green, and raise in red. Most of the time when you progress across the post slop streets, you want to aim to continue with around 70% of your hands. Here, you can see the folding frequency is 30% and those hands are the ones with the least equity. The remaining hands are divided up with a 6% raising range and a 64% calling range. These are the frequencies I'm talking about. Now, if this player faced a larger bet size, those frequencies would change. So there would be more folds and fewer continuances. It's only by practicing that you get to learn what good frequencies are. This is half the battle, and you get good at this fairly fast. Learning how specific hands make up these frequencies is much more challenging. In this example, the raising range consists of top pair and stronger hands, plus most of his best drawing hands. The highlighted hand king nine suited would be a clear fold, unless he has spades, in which case he has a weak draw and can call you should get the general idea. This particular example is very logical and easy to understand, but some of the solutions are very complicated and you have to learn about things like range balancing and blockers. For those of you who are wanting to explore GTO solvers but don't want to invest money in software, it is quite expensive. You can grab videos from training sites or YouTube and make the most of what's available out there. I've been steadily improving my own knowledge of solvers over the past two years, and I intend to release some material in 2020 designed to help others with this process. Here are some more basic frequency guidelines for betting across the post-flop streets. Aim for around 70% of your hands, and from those 70%, try and ensure that on the flop you have a healthy two to one or three to two ratio of bluffs to value bets. On the turn, that ratio should shift to one to one bluffs to value bets. And then on the river, one bluff for every two or three value bets. Most players don't bluff with a high enough frequency across the turn and river. If that's a leak for you, look to fix it. Coming back to the basics of GTO theory, I mentioned a minute ago that you need to understand range balancing. The reason for this is that every GTO range is perfectly balanced such that it cannot be exploited. If you do too much raising, too much calling, or too much folding, you become exploitable. A feature of range balancing is having individual hands in more than one range. So for example, you keep a hand in both your calling and raising range. This is known as a mixed strategy. For example, if you're holding top pair weak kicker on the flop, you're very often going to see bet, but then you should also sometimes check with it. A perfect strategy often involves staying balanced and mixed. Now you might be wondering when to choose which strategy. That's actually up to you. There are different ways of randomizing your actions, but for now, focus on the theory and the frequencies. The final point on this slide is a reminder that by taking strides to understand GTO play, you're giving yourself the chance to identify leaks in people's games. By knowing the equilibrium point, not only can you identify leaks, you can see how far they have strayed from the equilibrium. Once you've done that, you're in an ideal position to judge how best to exploit the leak. If you do all this by gut feel, you might get it right sometimes, but overall, you're gonna be much less accurate and crucially, your game won't improve. Learning GTO play drives lasting improvements to your poker game. This is the final slide on GTO ranges, which I added as a lot of people struggle with which hands to choose for bluffs. My overriding advice on this is to ensure you understand the frequency of bluffs you require. So how many value hands do you have? Which street are you on? 
what does your range consist of? Is your bet size going to be oversized, large, normal, or small? There's a lot of factors that are governing the frequency with which you should be bluffing. Remember, we're, we're considering a GTO range, so we're not considering our opponent at this stage. Once you've decided on a frequency, hopefully down to the precise number of combinations you're going to bluff with, then you can examine your bluffing hands and choose the most appropriate ones. You'll need to consider things such as showdown equity, especially if you're not on the river, and also blockers. I'm not going to talk much about blockers, but just so you get the idea, if you're bluffing at a board with a possible flush and you hold the ace of the flush suit, all the combinations of bluffs which you have containing this card are excellent for bluffing with as they deny many of the possible flushes your opponent might have been holding, including the nut flushes. This can make a huge difference to the frequency with which an opponent can call your bluff. So blockers are an important part of this and you should build your knowledge of them through practice. Finally, we come to talk about opponent's ranges. Take the previous range and think about which hands he would take certain actions with. Do they differ from the GTO ranges? And if so, how? If you're first to act post-flop, you will already have an idea of your opponent's ranges. If not, then you now need to consider how the post-flop action has changed their ranges. Off the table, use Flopzilla or Poker Cruncher and filter through those hand ranges decision by decision. One tip for you if you're new to this, start by examining narrow ranges. Pick an early position raiser or a 3-bet pot where the ranges start off really narrow from the preflop action. You'll find it much easier to handle narrow ranges and often by the river you'll be able to pinpoint specific hands a player must hold. That's really inspiring and helps to motivate you to do more work with Flopzilla. Wider ranges are also important to look at, but they get really complicated and you might find them exasperating, especially when you're new to this. There's a video link here for how to do range analysis using Flopzilla. Once we've assigned ranges to our opponents, if they differ from GTO play, we need to think about how we can exploit them. So the questions I like to ask are, are they too passive? Are they too aggressive? What are they doing too much of? And how can I exploit them? Correctly exploiting villains post-flop is a difficult skill. If you deviate too far from what is GTO, you could wind up getting exploited yourself. I lean on general principles I've learned through experience, especially from preflop preflop study in Holden Resources Calculator. This doesn't translate directly when dealing with post-flop situations, but the general principles do. There are times when an opponent doing too much of something has a huge effect on your optimal response, and there are times when it has almost no impact. To get a feel for this, you simply have to put in study time. To give you a, a simple example, um, an opponent raising too much on the flop won't alter your optimal seabet strategy much. Whereas an opponent never bluffing on the river will certainly have a massive impact on your optimal calling range. My final advice on this is to approach it from a GTO perspective. That's your starting point. Keep thinking about optimal frequencies, alter them appropriately to adjust for certain villain behavior and translate that into an adjusted range. And if you get totally stuck, just stick to your GTO response. Now briefly, I want to talk to you about some broad principles for exploiting leaks. Let's start with the opponent who is overfolding. This should be fairly easy. The simplest adjustment is to add a few more bluffs to your range. But you can also try lowering your bet size. Don't forget to think about the future streets as well. Are they folding too much here, but then also on the next street? 
Street-specific information can be really helpful, but difficult to come by. Against players who overcall, commonly known as calling stations, we should remove some or all bluffs from our betting or raising range and add some value hands. You're going to get thin value from a lot more hands than you might imagine. Exploiting over aggression is more challenging. You must not start playing too passively. There are times to trap your opponent, but times to simply fire back. You can do simple things such as widening your check raise range or three bet range, um, including more of both value and bluffing hands in those ranges. Remember not to do too much folding as your opponent will be bluffing too much. Passive opponents are much simpler to play against. They do too much checking, too much calling, too much folding, uh, not enough betting and raising. To beat them, you can stick to very simple poker, applying constant pressure, taking down lots of pots through non-showdown. If you come across an opponent with a street-specific weakness, for example, C betting 100% of flops, you then need to consider an appropriate counter strategy. For this type of player, he'll be over bluffing the flop. So he'll be arriving at the turn with too many weak hands. The way you exploit this would be to widen your continuance range, mainly by calling frequently on the flop and then exploiting their weak range on the turn and river. Street specific weaknesses are very, very common, but not easy to diagnose. Beware of small sample sizes, stick to GTO play if you're in any doubt. My final word on deviations will be a reminder to focus on frequencies and hand categories. You won't have time in real time play to go through every hand in a range. So think of them in groups and make sure there are enough hands in each group. If you're wanting to see bet 50% of your hands, but you've got say, only 30% you can think of to put in the bet category, you need to shuffle some more ace high hands or drawing hands into that category. By this point in the thought process, you ought to know what you're doing with each type of hand in your range. That just leaves your hand itself, a minor postscript. Follow the same thoughts as you did pre-flop. Where does the hand sit in your range? Is it borderline? Does it sit somewhere between calling and folding? If it is a borderline hand, maybe take a little bit longer over the decision. If it's a clear cut choice, then don't hang around. You might as well just go ahead and make your action. This is the final part of a big jigsaw puzzle. You have looked at the whole picture. You've not just been thinking about your own hand. Now's the time to think where your hand fits into that big picture. Make your action. Get ready for a new related puzzle coming soon on the next betting round. Now, if there is a bet or a raise behind you, you'll have another decision to make on the same street. Simply cycle back round to the A in BAP God H and repeat the process. You know the drill by now. This could happen multiple times on the same street, but there's no change to the process. So that concludes the post-flop thought processes, and I think it's high time we did some practice. Join me for the example videos and get practicing tops app god h and to spar bap god h.